This is part two of three, looking at chapter two, the chemical basis of life, part one. So in the first part of this chapter, we talked about atoms, uh, which is shown up here on the slide, how they have protons and neutrons and electrons. Um, they're set up on the periodic table and just kind of generally what they look like. So the second part of the chapter, we're going to look at how these atoms actually come together to form molecules. So in this section, we're going to look at how do atoms stick together or how do atoms bond together. We're going to look at the different types of bonds that we see in chemistry. So chemical bonds, they occur when atoms come together in different ways and we're going to bond these different atoms together to form our molecules. So molecule, the definition of it is just two or more atoms that are bonded together. And another term for molecules is a compound. Um, they're kind of similar terms but they're actually a little bit different. I use them interchangeably, but to give you an exact definition, a compound, specifically it's a molecule composed of two or more different elements. And I'll show you examples of a molecule versus compound. So these molecules and compounds, we write them with a molecular formula. And I'll show you again on the next slide the molecular formulas. So these molecular formulas for our molecules and compounds, they contain the chemical symbols of an element that are found in that molecule. And then you're going to have a little subscript or the little number, and that indicates how many of that atom are present in that molecule. Um, so I'll just show you what they look like. Okay, so up at the top we have four different molecules or compounds, and they're written with their molecular formula. So if you look on the left, we have an O with a subscript 2. The O stands for oxygen, and the 2 means that there's two oxygen atoms bonded together. The next one, H2O, it means there's two hydrogens and one oxygen in that molecule. The next one, C6H12O6, we have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens in that example. And then the fourth one, we have N2, we just have two nitrogens bonded together. All right, so if we look on the right, or left again, sorry, we have O2, we would call this a molecule. So we have two oxygen atoms bonded together. The next one, the H2O, which is the molecular formula for water. This we would actually call a compound because it has two different types of elements bonded together. So we have hydrogen and oxygen. So we'd actually technically call that a compound. The C6H12O6, our third example. This we'd also call a compound because it has more than one type of element creating the compound. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And then nitrogen, we consider that to be a molecule because it has two nitrogens. So just one type of element in that molecule. So these are how compounds and molecules are actually different. I usually call them molecules. Um, I thoroughly enjoy chemistry, but I teach biology so I'm not too worried about molecule versus compound and the terminology for that. Um, so I'll usually refer to them as molecules. These molecules and compounds that we've looked at, they are formed by elements or I guess atoms bonding together. And there's different types of bonds we're going to look at. So I'll list them first, and then we're going to work through them one by one. So the first type of bond is called a covalent bond. 
There's actually two types of covalent bonds. There's polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. So we'll get to the differences in a little bit. The second type of bond we're going to look at is called a hydrogen bond. And this relates back to polar covalent molecules. And I'll show you how that works. And then the third type of bond we're going to look at is called ionic bonding. So we're going to start off with covalent bonding first. So number one, covalent bonds. Covalent bond occurs when atoms share electrons with each other. So we have those valence electrons, those outside electrons on your atoms. These valence electrons, they can be shared with other atoms. So usually covalent bonds, we're going to see them when atoms do not have their outer electron full. So remember, the first shell can hold up to two electrons. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. If the second shell only has six electrons in it, that atom really wants to get another two. So atoms really, really want to fill up their outer electron shell. And these covalent bonds, when you're sharing electrons, are very, very strong chemical bonds. And that's because electrons, they behave as they belong to both atom and the bond at the same time. So covalent bonds are very hard to break. So I talked about how um, atoms want to fill out or fill up their outer shell. They want to get eight electrons into their outer shell. So this is actually called an octet rule. So atoms are really stable when that outer shell is full, when they have the full eight electrons in that outer shell. So for a lot of atoms, the outer shell fills with the eight electrons, so eight octet, so we have the octet rule. There's one exception, which is hydrogen. So hydrogen only has a first electron shell, and that first electron shell can hold two electrons. So you just have to remember one little exception is hydrogen. Everything else, all those other ad atoms, they want eight electrons in their outer shell. Okay, so here's an example of a covalent bond up here. So if you look on the left, we have fluorine. And fluorine has nine electrons. The first two electrons go in the first shell, the closest one to the nucleus. And then the seven other electrons go into the second shell up here. So we have seven electrons in that outer shell. So fluorine really, really wants to get one more electron, if possible. So this fluorine atom can actually covalently bond with the hydrogen atom at the bottom on the left. So hydrogen has one in its outer shell, and it really wants two to be happy. So the fluorine and hydrogen, they're going to share electrons with each other, so they're going to bond together. So if you look on the right, we have fluorine. It has eight electrons in its outer shell, and the hydrogen has two electrons in its outer shell now. So both of these atoms are very happy with this covalent bond. If you remember, a little bit ago I talked about there's two types of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar. And this has to do with something called electronegativity. So electronegativity, you can actually measure it, and it's a measure of an atom's ability to attract electrons when it forms a bond with another atom. So some atoms are more greedy, they attract electrons very easily. Other atoms, they're not as greedy, they don't hold on to electrons as tightly. So we have really high electronegativity and you can have lower electronegativity. In polar covalent bonds, these occur when your two atoms have different electronegativities. So one atom in the bond has a high electronegativity, it's really greedy. The other atom has a low electronegativity, it's not as greedy. So it's not going to hold on to electrons as tight. So this causes the distribution of your electrons around your atoms 
in the bond to create something called a polarity. And that's why we call it a polar covalent bond. Or your molecule that you form, it's going to have a difference in electrical charge across your molecule. A really good example of a polar covalent bond is water. So water is H2O. You have two hydrogens, which are kind of the white circles. There are two hydrogens. And then one oxygen molecule, the red atom, shown here. So when your two hydrogens bind to the oxygen, they form a polar covalent bond. So your oxygen has a really high electronegativity. It's really greedy. Your two hydrogens, they're not as greedy, so they don't hold on to electrons as tight as your oxygen does. So because of this, your electrons spend a lot more time around the oxygen atom. And if you look next to your oxygen atom on the right, there's a little negative charge. So there's a little partial negative charge, because remember electrons are negative, so if you're holding on to more electrons, you're a little bit negative in charge. Whereas if you look at the two hydrogen atoms on your water molecule, they have a little plus next to them, and that's showing that those hydrogens have a partial positive charge to them. And that's because electrons they spend less time by those hydrogens, so it causes it to be a little bit positive. So this again is that classic example of a polar covalent bond. You have this polarity within your molecule that's set up. The nonpolar covalent bonds, these happen when your two atoms have similar electronegativities. So they're equally greedy for electrons. Nobody's holding on to electrons more than the other. They're sharing them equally. So we have equal sharing of electrons. Good examples of this are two carbon atoms bonding together, carbon and hydrogen bonding together, or the picture showing two oxygen atoms bonding together. So these, again, are nonpolar. There's equal sharing of your electrons. The second type of bond we're going to look at is called hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding, I mentioned that hydrogen bonding happens when you have polar molecules. So hydrogen bonds, we're going to see it when we have those polar covalent molecules. And hydrogen bonds, they're very weak bonds individually, very, very weak, easy to break. But if you have lots of them, they're actually very strong bonds. So examples of hydrogen bonds are shown here. So hydrogen bonds, we see them between water molecules. So remember, water has a polar covalent bond within the molecule. And that polar covalent bond causes the oxygen to be a little bit negative, And the two hydrogens are a little bit positive in charge. So that negative oxygen molecule part of the molecule is attracted to the positive hydrogen side of a water molecule. So hydrogen bonds happen between molecules, shown here by the water on the left. And they're usually represented as dotted lines, and that represents that they're kind of weak, but if you have lots of them, they're very, very strong. In fact, hydrogen bonds, these are the bonds that actually keep our DNA held together. So if you have lots of hydrogen bonds, it's strong enough to keep our DNA molecules held together, or at least until we need to break them during DNA replication, for example. So these, again, are these hydrogen bonds. So we looked at covalent bonds. We have polar covalent, nonpolar covalent. In covalent, remember, you're sharing electrons. Hydrogen bonds happen between two different molecules, specifically water. It's a really good example of a hydrogen bond.
Then our third type of bond we're going to look at is the ionic bonding. So ionic bonding, this happens when you have an ion, and an ion is just an atom or molecule that has gained, so it has an extra, or it's lost, one or more electrons. Different types of ions, so if you lose an electron, it causes it to become positive, so you have a cation. If an atom gains an electron, remember electrons are negative, it causes it to become negative. These are anions. So when you have a cation and an anion come together, so positive and negative, attract to each other, that's an ionic bond. So your two ions are going to be attracted, they'll bond together. Here we have an ionic bond, so we have chlorine up at the top on the left, the green atom, and we have sodium, kind of this purplish atom on the left bottom. So this sodium atom, it's actually going to lose an electron, causing it to become positive and charged. That electron the sodium loses is going to go to the chlorine. So your chlorine atom gains an electron, it becomes a negative in charge. So then you have the positive sodium, the negative chloride. They're going to attract each other and that's going to form the ionic bond. If some molecules are unable to form bonds, they could potentially be free radicals. So if you have a molecule that has an atom that has one single unpaired electron in its outer shell, that electron, it wants to break off and bond with something. So if this electron just breaks off, it has lots of energy, it's called a free radical. And these free radicals, they can form from a variety of sources. So some free radicals come from UV light, other free radicals come from radiation, from smoking, from any type of pollution that we encounter. So these free radicals, it's basically an electron that breaks off it wants to stick to something, and it usually causes damage when it's trying to do this. So, so far we've talked about how atoms can bond together to create um, molecules and compounds. So once we have these molecules and compounds, we can start having more complex chemical reactions. So chemical reactions occur when one or more substances are changed into other substances. Specifically, chemical reactions, you start with reactants, which are usually on the left side of the equation. These reactants, they react with each other to produce the products. And products are usually found on the right-hand side of your equation. And chemical reactions We'll talk more about chemical reactions when we get to metabolism and photosynthesis and cellular respiration. But just to introduce you, chemical reactions, doesn't matter what the reactants are, what the products are, they're going to have similar properties. Usually chemical reactions, they require a source of energy to get the reaction started. And because of this, in living organisms, we usually have a catalyst, specifically enzymes, that will help with this reaction. And enzymes are very, very cool molecules, and it's one of my favorite topics, so we'll get to it eventually. Um, chemical reactions, they also tend to proceed in a particular direction, but eventually you'll get to this equilibrium. And Right now, you can just kind of know that we won't talk about equilibrium a lot. If you're taking chemistry, you'll have to know more about it. And then the fourth property in biology or in living organisms 
These reactions usually occur in a liquid environment, specifically water. And the third part of this chapter is all about water, um, why it's really important. We're made of 70% of water. So we'll have to talk about that as well. Here's one example of a chemical reaction, and this is actually photosynthesis up here, which I have referenced to quite a bit already. So remember, photosynthesis is where we take carbon dioxide and water and also sunlight. So those three things are reactants on the left-hand side of the equation. From this, we will get our products, which include glucose or sugar and oxygen as well. So this is one chemical reaction we're going to spend a lot of time looking at in this course. So in part two of this chapter, we focused on how atoms can come together, how they bond together to create molecules and compounds. So we have our covalent bonds, which include polar and nonpolar. We talked about hydrogen bonds and also ionic bonds. Then once you have these molecules and compounds, they're going to start to interact with each other and you can start getting chemical reactions. And again, we'll come back to chemical reactions when we look at metabolism. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you to chemical reactions. They use energy. We'll look at enzymes. Um, and then part three, we're going to look at the water part. So why water is really, really important for living organisms.